Uh, it is now officially eight o'clock and it looks like we have everybody here. So let's kick this off. I'll call the meeting to order of the uh, Tuesday, May 18th meeting of the Longmont Housing Advisory Board. Olivia, would you do a roll call for us? Yes, this morning we have Cameron Grant, Tom DeBee, Lauren Selly, Jean Christopher, Arlene Zortman. We also have Harold Dominguez, Lisa Gallinar, Karen Rowney, and Kathy Fedler. Excellent. Uh, first item, or next item on the agenda is the approval for the minutes of the April 20th meeting, which I have reviewed, but since I was not at the meeting, I just want to see if anyone else has any comments, questions, or modifications to the April 20th minutes. Jean. Yeah, I move to approve them. I second. Motion in a second. All in favor? Thumbs up, say aye. It is approved. The next item on our agenda is public invited to be heard. Olivia, do we have anyone from the public who'd like to speak today? We do not. All right, so we will move on to new and old business. Item 4A, which is a discussion on the retreat agenda regarding the Longmont Housing Authority. Uh, and there is some information in your packet about this in quite a bit in a minute that was helpful since I missed the meeting. It's a good way to catch up. Um, but I'm assuming someone is going to lead this discussion. It's not me. Kathy, you want to type in Kathy. this? Or... Uh, do you want to outline the retreat in general and then I can go into some of the data? Yeah. Um, so if you can see the council draft retreat agenda, um, the part that, so from 9 to 1030, they wanted to have an equity discussion. That's really for the city council to be, uh, it's more for them. Um, there's still some debate on that particular piece because I think want, some want to spend more time on this than others. And, and so we're not sure what's going to happen, but you all don't necessarily need to be there for that piece. Um, and then once 1030 hits, the rest is the housing piece. Uh, the housing conversation. Um, the council was very explicit in wanting you all there to be part of that conversation. And you can see that um, part of it for us is going to be a grounding um, on what we do with um, all of the city council members. Some have a more detailed understanding than others. And then we move into um, really some of the points and in, in setting some some goals for ourselves and really tangible goals that we can measure uh, our performance against on an annual basis. And you can see when we're talking about vouchers, development goals, partnership goals, um, different opportunities that are on the horizon and what that means. Um, and then um, getting into some of our operational goals. Then we continue from 1230 to two. And then um, at around two o'clock, you all should be finished. And they wanted to uh, spend some time talking about the sugar mill. You may want to stay for that conversation because I think there may potentially be an integration with affordable housing in that conversation, but I will leave that up to you all um, and, and the city council on this. Uh, so this is really devoted to, to what we've been doing over the last year. And um, I'll let Kathy, go over some of the data and then we'll work you through some of the questions. Hey, Harold, it's, um, do you want to let them know what the new date is? Oh, it's July 9th. Oh, I thought that was on there. Yeah, it's July 9th. We had some trouble getting all the council together. Okay. I'm assuming this is not going to be on Zoom. This is going to be no. in person? No, it'll be in person um, depending on the masking rules, uh, although we got some clarity. We, well, we got new rules that give us a sense of what it's going to be like. We don't have clarity necessarily on what it really is going to look like, but by then we should all be unmasked and so on and so forth. So um, 
they were looking at a location outside. And so we were evaluating that if mask were required inside, but it looks like we'll be clear um, wherever we go. So I think now uh, we may shift to look at a museum or some other locations, but we'll let you know. And there's a chance that our next meeting, well, I'm pretty sure based on what I've heard, I just need to see the details. Um, our next meeting is highly likely that we don't have to do it via Zoom for this group. But we'll let you know. All right, any questions about uh, what Harold's reviewed thus far before we go into the data with Kathy? All right, Kathy, why don't you take it away? All right. Um, so I did provide you a lot of data, um, kind of a data dump. Um, <clears throat> and my understanding is that probably in order to prepare for um, uh, what the LHA advisory board would like to share around development goals and goals of the housing authority from your perspective that next month's meeting will probably be spending more time <clears throat> on this to refine some of that. Um, but what I had handed out to you or gave to you was um, the most recent housing market analysis and needs assessment um, from the consolidated plan. This was prepared in late 2019 into 2020. So a lot of the data is still 2018 data because that was the best data that was available at the time through ACS, et cetera. Um, so by the time you prepare for this, it's a lot of times the, the information is somewhat stale, but not too terribly, too terribly bad. The first section of the housing needs assessment is a comparison of the consortium as a total. Um, comparing all the communities in the consortium. And then there's individual sections towards the back with Longmont starting on page 48. Um, but just some of the little highlights that are in the first part of it um, on figure one, which is on page three, the cost burden and severe cost burden by tenure. Um, Longmont is showing the highest percent of cost burden, um, but only the second highest in actual numbers um, because of the, the population is smaller in Longmont um, than in the other, uh, other communities. Um, same thing for owners. Um, we have a fairly, well, we're all pretty close in um, cost burden for um, homeowners um, across the region. But again, ours is a fairly small number of those. <clears throat> um, page five is a good comparison of the HUD income categories from 2015 to 2020. Um, so that's an interesting thing to look at. Um, I will add that the, um, the HUD income categories um, are kept lower in high cost areas like this um, because it doesn't allow for um, the I think it's the 50% area median income figure to be higher than the national 80% income figure. Um, so we are capped um, somewhat in our 30% and 50%. So you'll see less of a change or an increase <clears throat> over those five years in the extremely low and the low income categories versus the just the low income category. Yeah, you can um, ask me for a question about this. Uh -huh. I'm just trying to turn them to keep up. Um, so on, on the HUD income categories, are those the same as, or how do they relate to what we talk about you know, with inclusionary housing and such with area the median same. income? Yeah, so we same. use the same okay. across all of our programs so that we're not having multiple income ca uh, calculation figures and qualification figures so people aren't confused. Um, we've talked several times at council, at least a couple times in the 26 years that I've been here <clears throat> about maybe switching to a Longmont median income 
calculation figure. And it just, it, it's a lot of work to figure it out. It is, um, then you have to explain, and then you have to explain to HUD why you're not following their income figures. And it it's kind of a, a mess. So we've always chosen to stick with the, the HUD Boulder County um, median income figure. So it is the same 30%, 50%, 80% used across all of our programs, inclusionary housing, everything for simplicity. Um, you'll notice on figure three that um, incomes <clears throat> of renters have increased more than incomes of owners, um, which uh, the consultants were saying is likely due to one of two or due to two factors, increases in renters income and an influx of renters with higher income into the consortium market. And that seems to be consistent across the consortium. So that seems to make some sense um, as to why some uh, that has increased so much more. Um, well, and into that point, to give you a real tangible example, um, I was talking to the owner of 150 Main, um, just down the road here. I think they're over 90, they're, over 90, let's say 2% occupied. Um, and, and if you look at that during the time that they opened it up in, in during COVID, we're still in it and how people were coming into it. I think we're seeing something very similar at the new uh, rental units on County Line and 17. So a lot of these, and, and, and I want to kind of to go, I wanted to talk about this specifically. If you remember, well, you may not remember, we presented to council earlier and we talked about what we have in terms of rental housing within our community. Uh, what was it about five years ago, four years ago? And they talked about we didn't have a sufficient stock in these upper end apartments. Um, and what, we, what we're seeing is a lot of those have come online and they've been filled very quickly, which is also pulling some of the pressure off of those lower price apartments, but they're filling just as quickly too. I think it's a, another reason why our um, latest project, we're looking at doing income averaging, which will include a higher level of income, which allows us to do lower income at less of a subsidy because some of the higher incomes are helping to subsidize that. So it takes less investment in initially. Um, and it's a good idea just to have a range of incomes in an apartment complex, it seems like. Um, <clears throat> there's data um, on page six that's comparing the different races and the incomes, median incomes that um, across different, different ethnicities. Um, and then um, some information on the households and how they uh, stack up against the community stack up against each other in the different income categories on page seven, which is kind of interesting. <clears throat> um, on the uh, rental market, you'll notice that the um, Longmont had um, in the median rent income from 2013 to 2018, the our line looks a lot higher <laughs> in comparison to the others. We're still the lowest cost community in, in the consortium area and had a 25 or 27% um, five year change with a 5% annual change. Um, everybody's hanging about the same place with their vacancy rates. Um, vacancy rates have been pretty phenomenal or fulfillment rates, however you want to flip it, <laughs> um, have been pretty phenomenal um, for over the, since the recession, basically. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was um, on page 13, there's a chart showing average rent and income required to afford the average rent um, by the different um, rental markets. And at, um, at the time, 1418 was our average rent and a income required to afford that's about 56,000, not quite 57,000. If you go back to the chart in the, um, that was on page five that showed the, the differences in the in, um, extremely low, very low and low income categories um, to afford the, that rent at 56.7, one person, a single family household um, would have to be at the 80% area median income 
actually a little bit above it um, to afford that that rent. And a four person family would be at about 50% of very median income. So it's kind of interesting to see how, the, how folks fall um, when looking um, at, at the median rents. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, point out on page 15 is that um, Longmont had the highest percent of five-year change um, in ownership home values with 64% five-year change or a 10% annual change. Averaging the 10% annual change is about equal with everyone else, but we had a little bit higher um, overall five-year um, change, but still in the... Um, more affordable for the consortium. I also want to point out that this is looking at um, that. No, it doesn't say if it's well, this the goes average or not. I was going to say we we are consistently in the five hundred thousand dollar average now um, for the past several months um, in Longmont. And median is consistently in the upper fours um, for single family home ownership. Yeah, and Kathy, if I can jump in on this mm -hmm. one, this was 2013 to 2018. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what we're seeing now, um, well, that's home. What we're seeing now is to the point we're in the fives. And, and when the median is in the upper fours, and getting that close to the average, what you're seeing is that market just drastically shift. Um, and what's <clears throat> what's also now starting to happen too is um, when you look at what we have in the price points for new home construction, and then the fact of what we're seeing just in the market and the commodity side, that's continuing to push, which I think is also um, creating um, the need for, for housing stock and driving that price up. So you have different factors in play um, that, that's really starting to impact this conversation. Uh, Cameron was on the LEDP meeting and we had a, a really uh, good presentation about what's happening today. And um, it is not, I guess, Cameron, would it be fair to say that it is more common than not that people are getting over asking price and significantly over asking price. And people are doing some very creative things in terms of home ownership. I think I heard the story of round trip tickets anywhere in the world. Uh, they're coming in, it, it, getting inspections now is like completely, un, I think, uncommon. And mm -hmm. um, it, we, we truly are in, in a, a seller's market. So these price points are just flying um, in that other direction. Yeah, I, I think that's spot on, Harold. And I was, as I was looking through this earlier, I was thinking it might be helpful for this group to see a copy of that presentation. Uh, because even though, you know, even though my day job is in this world to a degree, it was startling to see it put down on paper and in numbers. And you, you hear some anecdotal stories that are uh, a little bit shocking about how deals are happening right now. Um, and the challenge of, of people who want to or need to find a home right now and just how difficult it is, uh, even for people with significant resources can't find a home. I can't imagine uh, you know, how much more challenging it is if, you're, if your resources are limited. So I can so, check with uh, M Melanie Bimson, who did that presentation, and see if she can share that with this group. Got it here. I'll share it. I'll share it. Um, I'll send it to Olivia, and and she okay. can share that with the board. Sorry, Karen. Any other Go highlights ahead. in this we had to talk about, Kathy? Um, so I was just going to point out on page 17, there's some interesting information about options for buying an affordable home um, across the region and the number of units that are available, which are very, very few, as we were just talking about. So um, in the different price ranges. Um, <clears throat> So, and then, uh, like I said, Longmont data, specific data starts on page 48, I think it is. 
Um, so that's something to take a look on and focus on um, more closely. Um, so then I did include a chart on all of the affordable deed restricted rental properties in Longmont. Um, it's a fairly big list. There's about um, 2,100 or so um, different affordable rentals. Um, just to highlight some of the um, items on the chart that show that are colored in an orangish figure are those that either have gone out of their um, period of affordability um, or could go out um, of their period of affordability in the next several years. Um, so we are likely to have to replace some of those units if they would convert. Um, we have found um, kind of um, counterintuitively, I guess, that some of the developments that could go out of affordability um, have not been doing that, specifically if they were more HUD funded or had larger subsidies originally. Um, that they have not, they've either been renewing on an annual basis for the Section 8 program, or they have re-syndicated um, kind of like we did with Aspen Meadows um, Apartments. Um, so that's been kind of interesting to watch. The ones that have gone out, and I don't think I included our loss of units. Um, did I? Yeah, the developments that, that have gone out of affordability, have really been um, ones that we have locally had um, funding in or subsidized. So ones that just received fee waivers, they were under the inclusionary housing program, um, the first one and received fee waivers. So that was really our only deed restriction um, hold on them. And all of those have, have moved out. So um, Hover Manor, as you remember, they, they converted. That was one that was Section 8, and they converted and went out of it. So that's, that's kind of the anomaly on that one. But the Shores, um, the um, Legacy Apartments, um, those two were under the inclusionary housing program at the beginning. They had fee waivers when the fee waiver um, time period ran out. Um, they opted out. Um, and then the LHA had some scattered site homes that were public housing units that they sold when um, HUD released those and were allowed to get out. And they used that those funds to reinvest in other properties that are affordable. Same thing with the Terry Street Apartments. Um, that became, uh, because of the location, more um, uh, the, the value had increased so much that um, converting those, selling those, converting them to market or whoever, whatever the buyer wanted to do with those and reinvesting those funds helped them do way more units at, at an affordable rate. So um, we've been tracking, tracking that as well. Um, there's a page that shows some of the limited um, special purpose housing developments like the in-between where you have to be referred in. Um, they're not just open to the market. That's why those are pulled out separately. Um, and some of the, the shelter beds on those. Um, <clears throat> there's a chart that shows the uh, deed restricted rental units by the different AMIs that they're serving. Um, one that shows the difference of senior and versus family and individuals. Um, and then one that shows by ownership, um, LHA, BCHA, Thistle, and then uh, the private corporations. So, um, and then there's a chart <clears throat> that's very colorful. We call it the rainbow chart or the spectrum um, that kind of puts into perspective all of the different um, housing developers and uh, affordable housing owners in, in Longmont and how they kind of all fit together in a continuum from emergency housing, housing first, sheltering the homeless um, through rental housing into home ownership um, housing. So it kind of shows the whole gamut of how everybody kind of works together and how you can kind of step up um, from, you know, being homeless all the way up into home ownership if your income continues to increase and how diff the different um, um, developers are serving different areas of the, the Longmont community. I think the other thing it really shows is that um, 
there is a place for everyone and everyone's kind of operating in their niche. There's not a lot of duplication of services um, or um, butting heads kind of thing, um, trying to go after the same property or the same um, income category necessarily, that everyone's kind of swimming in their lane and serving um, their segment of the, the population. And um, most areas of the population between zero and 80% are, are being served in one fashion or another um, in Longmont and th throughout Boulder County, really. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that in particular, um, but I've always found that really interesting kind of a, a chart. Um, go ahead. Was there something? I'd, I had a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. First, I thought that that chart was very, very helpful. I had never seen anything presented like that showing like the spectrum. Um, because it, it always seemed to me like you either, you were affordable housing or you weren't. <laughs> it was like, there was no step up. So that's really great. Um, one question I did have is, are there any privately held um, developments or anything that we have, or the city or LHA has an option to purchase um, and put into our housing stock, like a, a right of first refusal or something? Well, the only thing that the LHJ has that I'm aware of is the Chrisman development. So Chrisman one, which is existing and right behind Sonic, um, the LHJ um, will take over and actually own and manage in 2028, right, Harold? I think it was March of 2028 under our new agreement. I lost my mouse. Um, yeah, so we are in the process of renegotiating that agreement based on Crispin two and the development of that project. And so into 2027, first quarter of 2028, I think is when we have the, the ability to own that facility. Um, we do have the ability in this negotiation to begin managing the facility earlier once they reach stabilization under their qualifications. That'll be based on our ability to manage it and just the world at that time. <clears throat> but I think it's end of 2027, beginning 2028. But that's the only one that I'm aware of that we have that option. I think that's something that we probably should take a look at. Um, the housing authority, if they're going to partner in developments, that that is something that at a minimum, we should have the first right of refusal um, if it ever sells. And I, we were talking to Element about that as well um, because we were less of a partner in, in that one that we're, than what we're talking about with Chrisman. Um, but that that probably should be a, a negotiating point for us to do, you know, take a property off the tax rolls or do any kind of um, any kind of subsidies at all um, uh, for that going forward. Well, and once I, we get put, oh, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, I agree. That should almost be like a mandatory. If you want our help, you know, give us this option. We might not exercise it. It'll depend on the market and everything at the time. But um, I think BCHA is started doing that several years ago, um, which is where I learned about that. So it's good to know we at least have one option and that I, I like that we're looking at doing that in the future. Yeah, we, we, we really took, I guess we took that approach on this one based on what we're going to do once we get clarity as to whether or not it's, it, it's going in the 4% non-competitive round um, on the tax credits. And once we get clarity on what that means, um, we will <clears throat> we will come back to you all to vote on a recommendation that we have to take to council in terms of support, but it really is how we were coming in supporting both financial financially via, via our private activity bonds and these other components <clears throat> to then say, if we're putting this in, here's what we're getting out. We've also in it, adjusted the the revenue coming out of Christman one and that deal that comes back to the housing authority. So we shifted um, from a 50-50 allocation to 75-25, Kathy. Mm -hmm. And so that is actually gonna generate an additional $200,000 
um, over the next uh, six years to the, to the housing authority. So for example, we will also pull in, I think total amount is 600,000 and change of cash coming into the housing authority, right to own, right to manage, to do exactly what you just said, Lauren. And I think that needs to just be a foundation when we come in with any kind of financial assistance that we take into place. And so then theoretically at the end of, by 2028, we will own and operate a, prop, a property. If you net what we're getting out of it with what we're putting into it for probably less than a million dollars. And I'm doing a lot of rounding with the numbers right now we'll of the <laughs> details to you, but that's a pretty good deal. I mean, to say in seven years, you're going to own a property um, that, that will have over a hundred, what, 80, how many 80, units they have? 83 for Christman two, 114 for Christman one. So for over two, a 200 unit complex, we will own for less than a million dollars or when you net everything out. Um, that's a pretty good deal, I think. Probably one of the better ones we've ever entered into, <laughs> I would <laughs> say. <laughs> um, so the other data sets that I included were um, just a summary of the Section 8 um, voucher data or the housing choice vouchers over the years. Um, we're missing a couple of years of data. Um, 2018, 19, and 20. Uh, we'll continue to search for that if we can get it and plug it in here. Um, but the um, graph that shows um, the comparison of the, the budget authority to the number of vouchers is pretty telling over the last several years. Um, some of it is a adjustment if you don't have everything leased up that your budget gets reduced a bit. So some of it is our own fault, um, and but some of it is definitely a result of the increase in costs and how much more subsidy you're providing per um, family because uh, or per household because of the um, the higher HAP cost that, that you're paying the the portion that's paid by the voucher. Um, then there's a chart that shows uh, the different. Uh, communities that um, or uh, agencies that have vouchers in Longmont. Um, we're still trying to get mental health partners information as well. I think they're about the only other one that has significant vouchers that are probably placed in Longmont. Um, I'll check with DOH as well and see if there's any other agencies that, that they fund. Um, but as you can see, there is a total of about 880 vouchers that are in Longmont, only about 50% of which are ours. Um, the other half or really more than half are um, Boulder Housing Partner um, vouchers that the people have moved here and Boulder County Housing Authority, the same thing. Um, so that was kind of interesting. This has, um, have shift, has shifted a little bit um, from the last time we found this information, which was way back in early 2000s, um, but not, not a whole lot. Um, the interesting thing I thought was that Boulder Housing Partners has way more vouchers in the, in the consortium area than Boulder County Housing Authority does, which I was kind of surprised. Um, so good for them. Um, what the heck is this? It's, Oh, that's good. getting into the age receivables and everything. So that's the, the information that I have. I think with the information that Harold's um, going to have Olivia send out, I also have a chart that um, has tracked median um, uh, sales prices and average sales prices from 2000 um, to current, along with some other data around um, days on market and um, um, Get what the other one is. There's four different factors that um, that it charts over a long period of time. So some of that information I may pull together as well for this um, discussion for council around um, homeownership. Um, but really for the housing authority has been more focused on rental housing, which might be one of the first points of discussion, the 
um, housing authority has never gotten into home ownership. It's always been looking at rental um, and what what you think about that. And I don't know how we want to start having the discussion on goals, et cetera. Um, for this meeting, if it's too much information, you need time to think about it and really hit it in, at the June meeting or however you want to go about the rest of the discussion around this topic. I have two questions. Um, that presentation that you guys talked about, Cameron, um, did anyone bring up because I don't know what data you guys were using and, and discussing in that meeting. Um, but I've been hearing a lot about how building materials are skyrocketing. Um, in fact, we need some work done to our house and the guy actually just told us like, it's gonna cost you four times as much because buying this one piece of wood, which used to be $4 is now $80. <laughs> um, was that part of the discussion with all the new builds that are happening because I imagine that's going to trickle down and affect housing prices from developers. Yeah, that yeah. was definitely part of, yeah, Harold, Harold <laughs> found it right there. Yeah, that's crazy. So you add that to the, the market forces and the supply challenges in general, and it's, it's kind of a perfect storm, uh, not in favor of affordable housing right now. Yeah, because this is going to affect us even if, we start building, um, that's unfortunate. And then- well, I, had to, I had to change it to unmute. So this is the, the lumber market and what we're seeing. Um, I will tell you, um, we have um, a couple of construction projects that we're looking at that also looks at the steel market, um, you know, steel, copper, everything that goes into the construction of any kind of project. To give you a sense of, of what we did, what is creating some of the, the need for assistance on Christmas is I think we put Kathy, they put in that an escalation of what, close to three quarters of a million dollars mm -hmm. um, for contract pricing. Um, I'm looking at building um, well, we're looking at building two fire stations. Um, I had a meeting late last week. They said $2 million over budget to put it into perspective. Um, early to mid last year, we were about 200,000 over budget when the escalation started. So, th so these commodity markets are shifting everything dramatically. And then as I've been doing the research on it, um, depending on what you look at, at least a year from now in terms of when they think this will start stabilizing. And there's some um, industry experts that have written some articles that said it probably won't be until the end of 2022, where that really stabilizes to what it was before. Um, if you look at this chart doesn't go back into it. They're gonna send me some updated charts and then we'll present this once I get those because I didn't have electronic copies. What we're seeing today actually is mimicking what we saw in 2008 during the recession. So in 2008, there was a huge spike in commodity markets and then it went down. The difference in this is a couple of things. One, you saw sort of that preparation for a recession based on the pandemic. Um, the challenge in this is we also have issues where uh, being able to produce the products because of having people in proximity to each other. So everything from literally cutting the trees to processing the trees to building the metal is now also impacted by some of the rules that exist in some of the other countries and other states. Um, they're hoping there may be some more domestic production coming in to help offset that a little bit. On the other side of it, then you have the shipping issues. And so one of the examples that's coming out is a lot of times in the ports, um, our, the contractors that we're looking at to build the fire station said, timbers and metal products aren't available. And in some cases we know they're on the ship, but we're not sure when they're gonna get offloaded on the ship. So you have production, transportation, everything coming into bear 
that is causing this issue. What's also concerning me on this is we have a lot of federal dollars about to come down. So you take the lack of product and then you take a lot of federal funds coming in for projects. And I think we just need to watch and see because who knows really how long this is going to exist. And I forgot my second question, so. Sorry. <laughs> no, Big, no, bit like, I forgot it before you started. <laughs> oh, okay. <new> mom brain. <laughs> Polly? I would get to claim a senior moment there. <laughs> um, so I, I do think, Kathy, you bring up a very good point because ultimately the the only way that we can, uh, that most people can actually get out of uh, having to be renters, which will keep you poor forever, um, is home ownership. And I do think that we need to get into uh, home ownership, working with, say, Habitat or other groups like that, and uh, developers who do this uh, specifically. Um, home ownership has been, you know, fundamental to everything since the founding of this country. So uh, I do think we need to uh, be talking about that. I remembered. <laughs> Thank you, Polly, because you jogged my memory. <laughs> um, I was going to mention that, you know, BCHA is, is in the entitlement phase of a new development out in Lafayette. Um, and they are looking at getting into the home ownership realm as well. And I was talking to one of the staff members the other day and, and I asked how, you know, what are they looking at doing? Um, and they said they, they haven't, you know, gotten too deep into it, but definitely looking at um, like a thistle type um, deed restriction with a land lease and then also selling to developers um, who would then deed restrict kind of like the city of Boulder has and then they would just manage the program. So, I mean, I'm definitely interested in hearing more about that. And I think that is the direction we, we should go. But um, I also recognize it's, it's totally new for LHA. And I don't know if, if, if it would be done by the city or done by LHA, what makes the most sense. Um, but yeah, I, I, I definitely think we should increase, like Polly said, increase the stock of affordable housing for home ownership. Um, because yeah, renting is just giving your money away to make someone else rich, usually. Go ahead, Polly. Another model is what um, uh, the city of London does and also to an extent the city of Boulder has done and, and num numerous other cities whereby the city builds the land and then people in their rent are buying it back from them. That used to be called rent to own. <laughs> It didn't work too well, um, but uh, that's a, a way that people can get into it, even though they don't uh, technically have the down payment or all that stuff. Um, we don't want to get into a situation, which is what caused the giant meltdown in 2008, in which all kinds of people are being uh, urged to buy a house that they can't then afford to actually buy because their income isn't sufficient to maintain it. But when you do a rent to own thing, um, you're buying it back over time with your rent, unlike regular rent where you're just buying the house for the other guy. Uh, so, okay, thank you. Jean? Yeah, yeah um, I, I, I am, uh, totally in agreement with um, moving into the um, home ownership market, um, especially in helping um, people who are in affordable housing now move forward. For several years, and I think Kathy, you're familiar with this, and Polly, um, uh, in the neighborhood, there was the RISE program specifically designed to teach um, families uh, how to manage their money. Uh, and it, it was a whole umbrella of uh, information to, um, uh, to help them 
get their lives together and move forward. There were initially nine families involved in that. Two of them bought their own homes and moved out. And I would like to see not only our effort uh, financially in building, but also that supportive system that helps people understand what it takes to do this because a lot of them never got exposed to. So this, is, this would be our opportunity to do that, to add the soft service along with the hardware. So just throwing this out as a uh, devil's advocate kind of thing, might it make more sense for the LHA to focus on, on that aspect of it and getting some of our higher income renters ready to move into home ownership. Cause I know that I remember Michael saying at one point that people really had to be shown that they could make that next step because they, you know, they had had risen up through the ranks. So they had almost no hap whatsoever. And it was almost all tenant paid and to be shown that they could afford a mortgage with habitat or whatever, and that it was a good conduit. If we, had that pipeline going that folks could go into a habitat home and then maybe eventually into a market home. Um, or there may be, um, it's fairly unlikely, but maybe we could start to get some, um, a pipeline ready for um, inclusionary housing homes, the Blue Vista homes that are, you know, affordable at really 70% of area median income is what they're targeting right now. Um, so doing some partnerships perhaps, as opposed to us, just think about it, <laughs> maybe getting into a whole new market that we don't understand yeah, and, and we have, we to, have learn to learn and, and all that stuff, so. Uh, and to your point, Kathy, um, if the cost of building right now is, is obviously extremely out of proportion um, because of what we lived through, that maybe, Right now, we develop a program like that uh, that is supportive until we reach the point where it is worthwhile and, and profitable for us as government, you know what I'm saying, um, that it, it makes sense for us to build, to put that money in. Why pay 400000 now when in two or three years, it'll be back down to 100000 uh, Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think that if we started that program, because um, uh, we're talking about developing more family um, projects, a lot of LHAs are senior, but the family projects, which the neighborhood, Aspen Meadows neighborhood is, um, took advantage of that. And I, 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 am, I like your idea of, for right now, let's focus on teaching people how to do this as opposed to investing money, which we know is three or four times what it could be. I, I agree. I think one of the things- I like things, that idea. If I can jump in, I think one of the things we also have to manage is we have money coming in and there are time limits with that money. So you can't just necessarily sit on it either. And, and so it's, it's going to be um, how you, well, you <clears throat> sorry, what you look at, how you look at it, what are the timeframes on the money coming in from the federal government and what, can, what you can do for the money in terms of developing those houses? Because unfortunately, that's kind of what we're seeing is you have a lot of different pressures. So it's not like you can necessarily wait and, <clears throat> and to be frank, there, there is a, a significant concern that by the time you wait, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having allergy issues. By the time you wait, you may have other inflationary pressures that actually minimize whatever it is that you're gaining in this. And, and then if you have a lot of folks waiting they may actually prolong the price increases in this simply because the demand never goes away and the supply doesn't come in. What I wanted to share with you all, something that um, we met with some folks yesterday, and I'll show you this, because this is, I think, where the creativity is going to have to come in. So this is a group that we met with out of, um, they're in Buena Vista, and they 
these are manufactured homes. And I'm gonna slide to this screen to give you a sense of, and, and really this home ownership is really probably something that fits in our inclusionary housing world more than it fits in your world because we do focus on more of the rental piece. So if you kind of look at this Franklin here, which is a three bed, two bath, 1500 square foot home, and you can see, and they said their price points were up to date based on what they had a couple of days ago, 391,000. Um, you can see more of the townhome product, 294, 240. So I'm gonna take the Franklin <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you sort of the dollhouse view of this. So you go, Oh, come on. So you go, how can you build this type of house for the price points that they're talking about? Well, the way they're doing it is they manufacture this entire unit in, 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 a, manufa in, in a manufacturing facility. They put it on a truck, they come in and they drop it. They then take this unit and they put it on a truck and they drop it. And, and so then, um, just to kind of give you a sense of what it looks like, um, this is all built out. Um, and this is really a new product that if you look at it is similar to What you'll see in some of the smaller homes that we have in the Blue Vista area, I think it has that same look. Um, this is um, Alder Code, but you can see they, they take some of these price points up into the 500s, but it is, a, it is a different process of how you go through in home ownership. But what they're doing is they're catching the economy as a scale and how they produce it. So they're able to absorb some of the lumber costs and some of the commodity costs in, in a different way based on their production style. And so we are gonna- did that with um, the one in Netherland and they're doing it with Kaufman too. Yeah. Right, and so this is, a, <clears throat> this company, um, this development here. So this is um, to the point, this is really the first development of this style in the manufacturing. Oh, no, sorry, I'm not sharing it with you. Share it again. This is the first one in the state where they've really done this, but you can get a sense where they're creating a community um, with, these, with these manufactured units. Um, that's, they also have a phase two where they're doing multifamily. The reason this is brought to our attention is we actually have some market rate apartment builders that are looking at this. And, and so then you get into the economy of scale, the more units you can bring together in a community, the better the pricing is. Um, that conversation even evolved into, if there's enough of an economy of scale, they may be interested in actually building a manufacturing facility in the front range to supply that demand. And, and so um, at some point in the near future, we're gonna send a team of staff to, to Buena Vista to visit them because it's an interesting product and it's a product that if you look at the way they're designing their communities, they're not big homes, they're not large homes, but dense homes um, in livable, walkable communities, which really meets what the council said in terms of Envision Longmont. So this is what I think we're all gonna have to start exploring in terms of that affordable home ownership. So I wanted to share that with you all. Yeah. <clears throat> Harold, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that, you know, with the, the money that the city's been given to um, uh, facilitate the building, there's a time frame. What is that particular time frame? You remember what it is, Kathy? Uh, the 2024? Mm. Is it something? Yeah, something like it's that. Three years. Mm -hmm. Three years. Yeah, three years. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, <clears throat> so the challenge with that, just to give you a sense, is any project you're on, right? 
take nine months yep. to from conception, probably nine months to 12 months in development review. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have, the, if you put any funding into it, it has to be expended. And so then you take 12, let's say 24 months for its construction. Mm -hmm. You almost have to start on that now. And, and then you, what mm -hmm. we're thinking about is how you negotiate the contracts on the commodities so right. that if it goes down, you take advantage of that. Yeah. So the LHA and the city both are lucky in that we have land at least <laughs> that are, are could be ready to go pretty quickly. It's not like we have to go out and find some parcels. We've got several different options um, on that if we're doing you know full build. Or the other option is to do some purchase and rehab kind of thing, <clears throat> which will probably take us long. <clears throat> uh, Arlene, you had your hand up earlier. Do you want to go ahead? So several years ago, we lived in the mountains of Colorado, and the town we lived in was growing quite fast. And one of the things they did was do Boise Cascade Homes, which is similar to what you were talking about here. Um, however, the people that purchased those homes had to provide the lot for them and the, the hookups for sewer and water and all that kind of stuff. Is this price that is listed here on these homes does that include the property and the hookups or is that in addition to? No, can you ask me that? Sorry, somebody walked in. <laughs> and, um, what was the question again? The question is the price that you, is listed on these homes, does that include the lot and the hookups to sewer and water and everything like that? Or is that yes. something they're gonna, okay, yeah. okay. So think of it as a traditional housing development in that when you buy the house, you've absorbed the cost of all the tap fees, water fees um, in that price. Um, obviously their pricing is based on the tap fees that exist, all of the fees in Buena Vista or Buena Vista, um, mm -hmm. but it, it will be reflective of that. And in talking to them, so Longmont has some of the lowest fees and taps and things like that in the front range. So we think it may be similar, but yeah, it's all inclusive. Okay. So it could be cheaper if we do it on land that we already own and we donate the land. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And part of it is interesting. So they also partner and um, I forgot the name of the company, but there's a group out of a development arm out of Berkeley that specialize in just doing developments in the affordable housing world. Um, they were really interested in the property that we own adjacent to the lodge in Hearthstone and, and really almost, um, and this is new to Kathy because this hit me after Kathy left, um, working with that group out of Berkeley and then this and, and their product to look at a proof of concept on the front range for this type of work um, where they will come in and do all of it. They just need to have us on our side support them in the LIHTC kind of world. Um, and that may be where we have to bring in somebody like Sarah Bott to, to help them do it. But they would literally be the developer and it would be very similar to the Crispin development, but with a different product style. Um, and because their model is built on affordability. So if they even said to us, if you had an affordable project go into their production line, in a, four, in a market rate project, go into their production line, they put the affordable ahead of the market rate because of what they're trying to do to solve this broader market issue. So I, I tell you this, and, and you know, as I've been thinking about this and in this conversation, we're gonna need to explore it because I think this is what we're gonna have to talk about with both the council and you all of how we're gonna have to start thinking about this in a very non-traditional way, but gives you a very traditional housing structure that is not any different. And then look at mixed income as we're doing this too, because you don't want to consolidate it all in one location either. Polly? I just, yeah. Gina, yeah but if you want to follow up on Harold's yeah. point and then we'll go to Polly. Yeah, um, I, 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 I like all the points that, that you're making, Harold and Kathy. Um, 
I don't see why we couldn't do both in terms of if we're going to uh, go into home ownership uh, while we are developing, and I understand we need to get going quickly. That's what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, Harold. Um, in, those, in those months, we can be working with people to teach them how it's possible and how they can do that. And so we need to have both going so that when the house is ready, the people are also ready. I don't see any reason not to do both, except of course, the cost. <laughs> <It's> that. <laughs> well, well, that and staff capacity, that's the other issue that I have to manage too is staff capacity in that conversation. But we could find somebody we could contract with too. So those are things we'll put on our list and we'll, we'll try to flesh it out between the July night. Now, Paula, you go ahead. Um, um, Harold, I am glad you brought up the Buena Vista thing because that's been going on for a while. And I, I really do think that that's a, a terrific model is uh, manufactured homes. And um, <clears throat> they've done, I thought that they originally had to they couldn't find any um, manufactured home producer except in Nebraska, but apparently they have something else. Anyway, I would love to see that come to Longmont. Uh, I know you said that we used to have one, but if we did manufacturing homes here, because there is, I think, a growing market, it would give us a huge boost for and provide a lot of jobs, decent jobs for kids who don't want to go to college and all the way up uh, to management and all that. Um, the other thing I was thinking is in terms of home ownership models and in terms of low income, uh, we already worked with ROC, R-O-C, and uh, we worked with ROC to, through Thistle to uh, help turn the uh, tra uh, trailer park um, on North Main into a co-op. And uh, cooperative housing, while it also has its own problems, um, is one way that people can get in who don't quite have enough money to buy a home, but they're buying a share in a home. And that's one method of <clears throat> getting some kind of um, equity in their home. And moving up into uh, affordable into uh, uh, an actual home of their own although a co-op is depending upon the structure a way to home ownership too and i do think we need to you know in terms of uh partnering with um uh developers who actually do this for a living we do need to be partnering with those developers you men mentioned uh, as well as uh, places like Rock, who will serve as that bridge to, they will essentially front some money, teach people about cooperative home ownership, and then people are gradually buying it back and, and getting a share in, that they can sell and working their way into uh, having some equity in their lives and building wealth for their family. And do we have any partnerships with any lenders or um, institutions to help people get into a home that maybe don't meet the traditional um, background? Like I know Chaffa has some different products um, that are kind of like FHA, but you're not paying the ridiculous mortgage insurance. Um, Cause I mean, I have lots of friends here in Longmont who rent and they pay more for their rent than I pay for my mortgage. And I, I put $1,000 down on this house and this house for reference was $397,000 because I got a down payment assistance as a second mortgage. But, um, I, you know, the one, one friend I'm thinking of, you know, and I asked her, how come you don't buy? And she said, well, we don't have the debt to income too high. But, you know, in talking with her, she doesn't really have a lot of debt and they have decent income. So um, I'm just wondering, do we have any... Um, partnerships or anything like that through the city or that you know of that would help people qualify for 
for mortgages that they can't afford because I absolutely agree about the inflation issue. And like, I remember I worked in the real estate market doing title insurance and closing where I was watching people making like $40,000 a year in South Florida buy half a million dollar homes on a balloon mortgage. <laughs> and I was like, there's no way these people are going to pay for this in three years. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely don't agree with, you know, people getting into a, a house they can't actually afford, but there's got to be I mean, a barrier for me is, is the initial cost of buying a home. Like the closing costs are ridiculous. Um, down payment's hard to come up with, especially if you've been renting. Um, so, um, I mean, I really like this idea, like Jean was saying and, and Kathy that you pointed out, like maybe there's a way we can help people step up out of affordable housing into home ownership. Um, thinking of like the PIE program. I know that people can save money, but it's not a lot. I mean, I think it's what five thousand dollars max at the end. Yeah. Um, so I, I would, I would love to look at some creative ways to help people move, in addition to looking into building. And I had not heard of one of us, so that is really exciting. So that would be, I would love that here. And those houses actually remind me of the ones in North Boulder, up in the Holiday area. I call them the chicken coop houses because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what they remind me of. They're so cute. Um, so yeah, I, I like that style. Tom, did you have something? Yes, I did. Um, so I uh, agree in the, the home ownership and, you know, that's kind of the next step uh, in the affordable housing. Um, but I still, I think we should almost stick to our lane of, of rental of the, of the home, uh, home projects, uh, excuse me, the apartment projects. Just because what I'm seeing is there's a $2,100 unit shortage in our region too, uh, anything below $625. So, I mean, I think we should maybe dip our toe in for the home ownership side, but I think our main focus still should be managing these affordable uh, apartment units. Um, and it kind of leads me to another question too of, you know, with these, possible units that are expiring or have expired, could we go after them too to see if they're interested in um, ha either having us manage it or purchase it as well? And maybe then having a, a rehabbed as well through HUD. Yeah, I was having a similar reaction. We, we, we've seen a lot of data that, that identified some of the, the gaps and we've talked about some you know, techniques to solve some of the problems, but the, the challenge for us, kind of, what's our role in all of this? Um, more than just philosophizing about the challenges of affordable housing, what, what can what can we really impact? So I, I tend to agree with Tom that that a, the, a large portion, or maybe the largest portion, of our energy and funds ought to go to what we're really good at. Um, but I don't want to leave out the other pieces because I, I think we can dip our toe in that water. You know, you, know, you take 10 or 15% of our, our focus and put it on um, helping educate families and individuals to, to, uh, uh, and connect them with opportunities to transition out of the situation they're in to, to whatever the next tier looks like. Uh, but, but stepping back, you know, when I, when I'm, trying to figure out is how between now and say our next meeting and then July, do we distill this down to something that can be helpful to council uh, and in their role as the LHA and council to, to move this problem forward? What, what, what's our path? Are you going to jump in, Kathy, or do you want me to? No, I was waiting for somebody else to. <laughs> I'm trying to. So a couple of points where I think, at least on our side, where this conversation starts blending a little bit more for me and Kathy and Karen is, is we're sitting in. So there's, there's this thing for us where we're sitting in both slot, slots or actually all three slots. So when you look at what we do from um, in our community and neighborhood services and housing retention and those types of programs, that really gets to the programmatic piece, but that's a city piece. 
when you look at for sale and home ownership, that's a city piece. And then to Tom's point and Cameron's point, when you look at the multifamily rental market, that's the housing authority piece. So generally for us as individuals, we're in all three slots, but it's which hat are we wearing and where? And, and so I think for us, this conversation's really kind of highlighted the need to parse those out and where they fit. And then for you all, when you say, I think for you all is to, to then come in and say, in the world of the housing authority, here's how we really see the fit for the housing authority and what we do. And, and here's where we wanna be and here's what we wanna see as a board on that side, specifically getting into development of units, um, types of units we develop, how quickly we wanna develop units, how we partner on those projects, what we get out of the partnership on those projects. I think if we kind of in this world focused on that, that may help with some clarity knowing that in that conversation, we may slide into these other pieces with the council because that's a hat, taking off the housing authority hat, putting on the city hat in this. I don't know if that helps at all. I'm trying to find the agenda again. So if I'm looking at this, then getting into where, where do you see us being and how do we increase vouchers? What are the targets you want us to see for increased vouchers? Um, and how we need to look at the concept of project-based vouchers impacting on supporting projects that we develop. Um, specifically, what we're hearing too is the more local vouchers we can bring into these affordable multifamily rental projects. That increases the likelihood of success. And then what do you see in terms of development goals for us in terms of bringing the property, you know, how many properties do you wanna see us develop in your purview of the rental world, if you want to stay focused there, and, and then laying out how we partner on this. So I would take that, the first three bullet points and put them in the mindset of what you all think we need to do from a housing authority perspective in the rental property management world. I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, it at least helps my mind because I like the structure of it. Um, you know, and I would think you know, maybe in the interest of, of time, one option for us would be to take this structure plus the information and discussion today and kind of offline spend our time thinking about this and, and come back at our meeting next month um, with any additions or revisions to this structure we would like to propose. Uh, is that enough time for us if just one more meeting before the retreat to feel comfortable that we can add some value to council's discussion? So, uh, I want, yeah, I wonder if it'd be helpful if we design some more specific questions, um, maybe in more of a um, visioning format kind of thing. Um, for the next meeting to help delve down into some of the areas that we anticipate you all being able to provide feedback to council on. And then devote the next meeting solely to, to that. Um, so for instance, I, I realized I, I didn't include, there, there is a mission and a vision for the housing authority to send that out and see, does that still meet any kind of need or not? Um, and by having some maybe more specific question, I wrote down some goals just from what you were talking about at, at check-in. Does this, does this, is this what you wanna um, take a look at as, as goals um, kind of thing? So maybe some providing some more additional information to what we already have in an outline for discussion for the next meeting. Yeah, I, I like that. And, and I'm glad you brought up the mission. When we were discussing this, I pulled that up and was, was staring at it as we went through these ideas. And it's helpful to have as a reference point. Um, basically, everything we talked about can fit within our vision. Uh, the trick is that next step of, okay, you know, you know, 
we all these things are on the menu, but we can only have one meal this year. So what, you know, what are we going to pick and choose and put on the plate and focus on? Um, so, so that to me is what we need to try to zero in on in the next month and then start that discussion with council on the ninth. And I think for us, we need that specific, we need those specifics because we see the vision and here's where we are and we're just seeing opportunities and moving them, but we're not sure. And we think it's in alignment with what we, where we need to be. And at least we're hearing on Christmas and things we're getting a head nod. But I think we do need that. We need to get into that next level and those specifics. So we have some policy guidance so that as we're doing this, we're not necessarily guessing, but we know, hey, this clearly fits in with what the guidance is and we can pull the trigger. And I think that's the clarity from an operational perspective that we're going to need to get out of this. So um, we're not making potential judgment calls that may or may not fit in with what you all want to see or what the board wants to see. Did we kind of put together almost like a timeline like you guys did for the merging of LHA and the city and look at, okay, here are the immediate needs in the rental area, like Tom mentioned. Let's increase our rental stock quickly as we can using all of these federal dollars and opportunities like the Cruzman one and two. And let's see how we can reach a goal there first with a five to 10 year goal of having a, you know, homeownership to own project, because really if we're developing apartments, there's an opportunity to develop also home ownership units within that same community and having that nice mixed community where you don't just have all renters um, and even having some market rate home ownership in that same area. So it's very diversified, um, might attract some different um, investor situations as well and, and have that be a future goal. Um, and, then in the, and then also go along with trying to come up with a program, if that is part of our vision, after reviewing all of this mission statement and vision statement, do we wanna look at not just providing homes for people, but information and coming alongside people to help them step into home ownership? And also, is it possible if we do um, look at home ownership in the future to prioritize people who are in our programs already over people who are not. Um, if that's our goal is to help people get there, I don't, I don't know if that, that wades into some equity questions, we'd have to look at that, but that might be something we could do where they get like an extra point, you know, if they're in the program and we're helping them step up or something. But, but making that timeline of like, here's our immediate need, here's what we could be working on in the, in the midterm and then future goals, maybe that might be, um, more of a concrete easier way to look at it because yeah I agree like yeah we can have all these ideas up here and that's great but um we need to focus on what we need now I don't know because I really liked Harold I really liked your your timeline that you made for us and I know it changes so mm -hmm. okay but it might, might be something good to present to the board if they're if they're looking for that Good. So what, what, anything else we need to cover on this, this topic in preparation for next month and, and the retreat? I think we'll just bring it back and you all take this and put together your ideas once you have the grounding in it. And then we'll, we'll go from there. Sounds good. Well, thank you for the the, all the data and then some interesting discussion and possibility. It's it's, uh, it's a little overwhelming, you know, to me. So I I'm I'm craving that uh, focus, but hopefully we can get there in the next period of time. So let's roll on to item five A city report and update on operations. So I will um, go first um, and then I'll have Lisa jump in on the vacancy reports. Um, so the uh, 
we haven't made much progress this month, um, basically, because we're getting prepped for the LHA audit, which is in-house this week. Um, we did get the lodges um, voucher paid in May. So that'll come off the ledger. Um, the reason probably for the increase is the Hearthstones April. Um, that was a huge increase going back to January to get the new contracted rent. The original budget that HUD approved didn't have the replacement reserves in it. Um, so we had to have two different periods of contracted rent, which caused the threshold to go over on HUD's side. And it's just trying to explain that it's, it's legit. <laughs> we just need to get it paid. Um, HUD has required um, that we begin submitting financials to them as well. Those were the two properties that we actually didn't have to submit um, reports to, um, but they are going to be requiring that on a monthly basis. And that starts next month. Um, they, we do also have some deadlines um, from our MOR audit um, that we've asked, asked to be extended till the end of the year because with uh, they want a 100% file review um, of all the Hearthstone and Lodge units to make sure everything is compliant in the files as well as um, getting our AR in balance. Um, so we have said we will take on, a I mean, because with with the property management in place, we just don't have the bandwidth to do that all at once. So we did ask for an extension to the end of December um, to get that all completed. And we'll report on that um, on a monthly basis with the financials as well to show which files have been reviewed um, and which ledgers have been cleaned up. Uh, it's a little complicated to clean up the ledgers on a Hearthstone on 202 properties because the system is pretty automatic. So if you make one change, it could affect another. Um, so we have to be really diligent and careful um, as we move forward with those. Do we have any questions on the AR aging? One thing I do want to explore when <clears throat> Kendra talks about the issues with the 202 properties, we're actively discussing getting them out of the 202 program because it just creates so many issues for us in terms of what you have to do and how you have to do it. And it just doesn't work like any of the other properties. And we're not sure what value, um, am I saying that appropriately? the value that we're getting out of being in a 202 program. We're not sure why that happened, um, but it almost creates, we can accomplish the same thing and do the same thing and not be in the HUD program. That's where we think we need to be. The challenge is you can't just immediately get out of it. You almost have to get in a waiting list um, to, to accomplish that. So we're starting to explore that just because of the challenges we're having that Kendra's talking about. Okay, Harold. I, I can uh, understand you wanting to explore the options, um, but getting out of it, uh, the, the one, the, the biggest benefit of having 202 is the huge amount of rent subsidy, and more, the very extremely low can afford that. So I, well, we can look at options. How can we still keep that? availability and um that's right. where that's where hud comes in and but, so, I, but okay. we got a consequence of not being there that's what i'm looking at so transferring them from a 202 to a it's kind of a rad program it's a subsidy program you actually transfer at the same contracted rent um, as you mm -hmm. are today so it's similar to, and the subsidies would be the same. They would still be paying 30% of their income. That would never change. We would still have the contracted rent. What you kind of get rid of is all of the HUD obligations that are required, which is submitting the budget, getting it approved, which, making sure you have. Yeah. Uh, and so we would still have to do that. I mean, we'd still have to do that on the LHA side, um, right. but it's just, you're not, There's so many fine tooth details on a HUD 202 property that you have okay. to follow. Yeah, Kendra, I appreciate you keeping that politically correct. Basically it's bureaucracy weighing it down. The requirements are so detailed 
And we have so many of them. It's bureaucracy that weighs it down. And it costs us money because it costs us time and staff. So, yeah. So they, um, the other program you mentioned, you mentioned rep program, the option that we would go to um, would still keep that 30%. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. I'm, uh, I'll get off my soapbox. Oh, no, you can. (laughs) That's all good. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where we stand. We are making progress. Um, a lot of the property managers are looking at their ledgers and they're sending me details um, monthly to, to get corrections. A lot of it's just a flip-flop from HUD subsidy to rent um, is what occurring. So there's not really like we've underreported revenue. It's just we've reported it on the wrong side, kind of in a sense. And I didn't know if you wanted to, if we wanted to go into the budget comparison or if you want to tackle the, the vacancy first, Lisa. Um, I can go through the vacancy. The report provided showed 30 vacant units. We're actually now down to 26. And out of those 26, 14 of them are also rented. So we're making some huge progress on getting these leased up. The only thing that's been standing in the way is the Aspen Meadows kind of, it's kind of hard to rent right now with all the construction going on for both the neighborhood and the senior because people don't wanna come in with the parking lot torn up or contract trucks all around. So we are seeing a slowdown there, but she has been able to rent a few of those. The Spring Creek, Hearthstone, Lodge and Fall River are completely full right now. And the Suites has 10 vacants, but seven of those are pre-lease. So making some progress. Our hey Lisa. Yeah. Hey Lisa, how many of the how many of the ten are associated with MHP? Eight. Okay, I wanted to so make been- that point because when we talk about vacancies at the suites, we control some, and MHP controls some, and typically where we're seeing the vacancies sit is on the MHP side. Mm-hmm. What, what is LHA- that contract like anyway with MHP? Is it are we required to give them those ten units? Or okay, is or it 50%. Contract, you, is it a contract directly with MHP or is it uh, with HUD? How how was that? Yeah, De- Department of Housing. Department of Housing. Okay, state. state. Yeah, so they have forty units. Yeah. Okay, All right. So we can't get out of that if we're seeing that they're just not renting them. It's um, <clears throat> it's a conversation that we're having, and which is why I wanted to make the point when we look at vacancies. There's things we can control and things we can't control. This is a conversation that Karen's having with other jurisdictions because they're seeing similar issues. And the issue is that MHP is the only, Karen, what are they called? They're the only um, authorized voucher administrator for the Division of Housing for Boulder County. And so, and so-, and so to Harold's point, I, I, you know, there, there certainly has been advocacy with throughout the county of um, having DOH open up that process for other administrators to apply rather than just having one entity being able to serve that role. And so where is it? Go ahead. Go ahead. And I see, I see, you know, value to them uh, having those units, but I also want them to use the units because it's also taking a spot away from somebody else that could be using that unit like long-term. It, it is. And, and, um, and I think we talked about this before is that we are, um, I would imagine, you know, Tom is going to be this week, first part of next week is that we will be submitting to the division of housing um, an alternative tenant selection plan that again, um, lets us for those MHP vouchers lets us draw from three different sources of applicants to be able to um, fill the, um, the, the units that MHP manages on um, in, in a better, more efficient um, and faster way. So we are, we are working it and um, because it, it doesn't matter who, <laughs> who manages those vouchers, it, 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 it absolutely affects the bottom line for the LHA for, for sure. Yeah, and it just seems like it's an ongoing problem. That's kind of what we're talking about is MHP is always having these vacancies that are outstanding. 
Yeah. yeah. And to our point, that cost us money and creates financial issues for us um, to the point where Karen's really been leading the charge. She's brought me in on a, one conversation where um, basically said, you're killing us and this needs a change, which is why they're submitting that other proposal. I think on the other side is also a parallel conversation with our uh, the jurisdictions we work in this world that we work with in this world, so Boulder Housing Partners, the county, and really as a collective, once we get all of our, once we get our arms wrapped around this and the message we wanna to send to DOH, I think it's a multi-jurisdictional message coming from Boulder County to open it up. We still have some work to do. I wanted to get this on your radar because it is something that we're working on and I didn't want to get, I didn't want us to outrun our headlights on this one. All right, where else are we on the city report? Any yeah. questions on the vacancy? So I will move into, so I, I know last, um, last meeting you asked, you know, can we see the budgets? I do have the property budgets um, ready to go. Um, next month, I could definitely have the LHA and all the other properties ready. So I wanted to at least present those to you today. The system has two um, different types. So one is detailed and one is more of a count tree where it kind of rolls everything up. Um, on administrative costs. I don't know what you would like to see. I think there's some things in the income that are missing that you would probably like to see, such as, you know, how much is vacancies? It's kind of rolling it up into net tenant income. And I think vacancies is kind of an important thing um, to review. So, I mean, there's some things that I think it collapsed too much and, and maybe some things that it doesn't, but I you know, want your feedback on what you'd like to see because I think there are abilities in the system to create different account trees that roll up differently. Um, I may not be able to research and actually figure those out probably until the fall or winter um, of this year. So we can, we can move forward with one of these reports we have right now, um, but getting your feedback would be great. Um, the detail goes into the detailed budget, which is you know everything that we've budgeted. Um, we are finding that there are certain things that we probably need to be more detailed on um, as far as coding wise, so we can easier budget in the future. Um, for example, one of them was the payroll benefits. Uh, you know, there's one line for payroll benefits and that doesn't necessarily include what happens on the payroll side, but other additional costs. Um, such as workman's comp and life, STD, all that. That's a separate cost that you need to budget for and is not rolled into the payroll. So we're starting to separate, separate those out and separate those things that can be more defined so that when we do go um, to budget in 2022, it'll be a, a little simpler for us. Um, along with getting the kind of uh, analysis on, you know, when it hits. Right now, a lot of things are distributed evenly across the board, but that's not how things hit. You know, you know, gas fluctuates, you know, at different periods of the time, the utilities fluctuate. And so we want to get to a point where we can actually enter that fluctuation in the budget as well. And I'm kind of doing that as I go so we can kind of get a baseline for next year. Does anybody have yeah. any questions? Yeah. And I, I mean, this is great. It's very helpful. Um, and kind of like, I like that summary view and like if we could break out that net tenant income, like you said, that's kind of, I was already kind of on the same agreement of that. And then the, all the other expenses, I mean, if we did have questions, we could just ask those and then you could provide the detail if need be um, okay. at that basis. One thing that would be helpful is if we had a percentage of budget that was used. Mm -hmm. um, so then we could kind of compare how far along we are in the year to the total budget as well. Right. If that could be added. And it does. So, so there is the option mm -hmm. on the, on this to do what's called right now. I just did the actual versus budget, but yep. you can do a tool that's called the variance. So yep. that'll do actual budget, give you the variance in dollars and give you the variance percentage. Okay. Um, so it's a four column. It'll be a bigger report and I'll have to divide yeah. it, but that's, that's not, not a problem. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. 
the one thing I would say on that, because um, I had a similar question and it may just take us some time to get better at this is also understanding seasonality. And so Kendra kind of right. touched on this because what you'll see is the variances may look different, but if, if we're coming out of January, February and March and we have a really cold winter, you may see it look different just because of natural gas usage or and so just sort of a word of it's going to take us a year or so to figure out the seasonality within this and to, to continue fine tuning. it. Yeah, but that could be easily explained too. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that is a seasonality side to it. You're going to, ex mm -hmm. you know, or we're going to expect to see the utilities spike at the beginning of the year and slow down yeah. and then maybe spike in the summer again, something like that. Yeah. Okay. No, but this is, this is exactly what I wanted. And then if, yeah, if we, we have the, the complete picture, I think that's what we're looking for. Okay, perfect. I think the, um, the other thing and some of the things that Lisa's doing um, that we've seen in other budgets, just to give you a sense of, we are really managing who we call in for services and, and what we call in for. And so we're running those through Dennis and Lisa um, because we were seeing some <clears throat> issues in different properties of where, um, we were just calling people to come in and fix it versus having our maintenance folks try to look at it. And, and so we're trying to get some cost containment there because as we look in the past, I was seeing some outliers in past budgets of, well, why were we here? And, and so we're also making some operational adjustments based on what we're seeing in the financials. So I have a question um, and I agree with Tom that I think we need to see the percentages because that gives us a better idea of where we're at. And I wanna make sure I'm looking at this budget correctly. When I'm looking at actuals, is that getting us from January through April? Yes, uh, it, it probably also includes some May, whatever's transact transacted in May. The problem, okay. with, the problem with the Yardie, the way it works is if I don't go out to um, so we can we can go out to April and it'll show mm -hmm. you just what's been budgeted out to April on a divided that can kind of get and that's where you would kind of see anomalies that would kind of get a little crazy once we start getting that fine tune and seasonality. So obviously we can do that. So if I do this range from January to April, it in, mm -hmm. it'll include just the budgets divided evenly to April along with um, the actual. So I can do that. I went out for the full year so you can see the entire budget. Um, so, so let me know what you prefer. That was going to be my question was, is the budget the year or is it just for the quarter or however it goes? Okay. Yeah. Right. So I could do both. I could do one that shows up to this point so that you can kind of see that along with showing the yearly analysis. Well, if, if our speed. budget but evenly for the year, I think we just have a cutoff of, of the previous month end. And then that would be easier to, mm -hmm. to review and look at. If we're, if we're not budgeting by month for a particular account, it doesn't really matter then at that point. Okay. So you should almost see, you know, if we budget perfectly, you would see actuals equal budget. But if there is some seasonality, you would just, you might see actuals above yeah. budget and you can just explain that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So then, I mean, then you want, we, do we still need then the variance and the percentage if it's going to be like you're expecting the actual to equal the budget? I, I'll leave that to some of you guys if you guys want to. Well, it depends on if you like that visual appearance. Yeah. I would say Not yes. I have to do the I math think, for yeah. you. I would say yes because of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Kendra, why is there nothing budgeted for expenses under the lodge? Is that just something weird happen in Yardy or? Well, are you looking at financing expenses? Um, I am looking at whatever all expenses under the lodge budget on the roll up one, there's zeros. Those are on the, fi I see zeros on the financing. Oh, no, 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 no. no, no. Okay. All right, let me check that out. I see what you're seeing. 
That that's a computer glitch because I've seen one where it has it all lined out. I don't know what it did. And then the Asimeto Senior Apartments, we had like twenty three hundred budgeted for tenant services <clears throat> and thirty five thousand in expenses. Do you know what that difference is? That's probably the relocation. That is the relocation costs that are coming through for the MSA construction project. So we need to move that then because that's being covered by that's the part of the yeah. Uh, so we we're we're tracking them separately so that we have all those costs in one budget and then it'll get moved to to WIP. Um, gotcha. My understanding okay. was it was supposed to be um, that was a. a a soft cost that actually does get expensed down, but Alexis said that those can be rolled up into the construction. So there are some things that can, that need to be expensed and some things that can roll up into the capitalization. So at first we thought those weren't uh, okay. allowed. So you'll true up once it's done. Yeah. yeah and then we'll you'll either it. bring a revenue in or move the expense out. It'll go into WIP and then they'll, we'll capitalize it between what, what gets divided between the loan um, and what gets capitalized. Yeah. So you take the expense out once it's ready. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So if you all don't have any other financial questions, we did um, hire the, um, the accountant um, to work with Kendra, correct, Kendra? I met her. We are fully staffed. We have the accountant. She started probably about a month ago. And we got the accounting technician. She started last Monday. And, and so when so. you see some of the audits, and we'll explain this as we were going through transition, some of the audit comments that we were planning to deal with in this method still existed because of the transition point. But now once we're fully staffed, they're working a plan for separation of duties if Kendra and others are out. And so we're now at the point where we're really dealing with those audit comments, but you will see them again because of just where we were in the transition for last year, but this year it's a much different picture. So on the other, op if, if we can move to some of the other operational adjustments um, on the security update, um, I just wanted to let you all know that we did get at the village where we were having issues with someone getting in. Um, we did actually get the lock covers placed. Um, and um, what we've, we haven't seen any of those issues again. In, in that facility, but the cameras are, were they finished Friday? Or Lisa, I know they were supposed I, to. I believe they're all installed. We're just waiting for the final hookups with um, them getting it all onto the DVR system and having accesses and then getting our remote access set up. So that'll Hopefully be in place. By end of week. That'll be in place. And then we're gonna work a process where we can also work with our, um, who all has access and maybe even work with our police department and giving them access to it. Um, that is also part of the project at Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments and, and the work that they're doing there. We're also evaluating um, how we can do that at Aspen Meadows Neighborhood um, based on a conversation that we had Friday in terms of security issues. We think we're really dealing with the areas where we're seeing and we're not necessarily seeing those issues at other properties. So we think we're at a really good spot now in terms of security and what we're dealing with um, and getting these properties addressed. Um, so you all know we've now added Sarah Arney who is in our crime-free multi-housing family housing group. She has been working a lot with Lisa and, um, dropped her name, Corinne. Lisa. Corinne. Corinne. Corinne, um, and we've included her in our weekly meetings to get those updates. Um, you know, knock on wood, even from public safety's perspective, in terms of issues that we were historically seeing at the suites, um, we're definitely getting a much different report now uh, from public safety and where they're seeing the world. So we're really happy about that. I think that's a product of a couple of things. And so this is really kind of 
verging on property security. A, um, the fact that Corinne's been in the building um, and establishing the relationships with the residents there has made a tremendous difference in terms of the interactions that we have at that location. We've also brought Brandy in from our senior services group and working on some of the case management and, and advising um, all of us, but Corinne on how we have the tenant relationship, that's also made a significant difference. So um, Mark on the wood behind me, um, <clears throat> generally that was the property where we were probably seeing the most significant issues and the, the highest number of calls for service and those things. And it is, I think it's fair to say drastically different today than it was four months ago in terms of what we're seeing at the property. So we're really happy with, with the progress that we've made. And I think it's really helping us inform other strategies that we use on, on other properties. So I wanted to let you know, um, that's kind of, again, what we hope to see. I don't think we thought we would be in this spot as fast as we were, um, but we're definitely starting to see the results. And that's just a testament to the entire team that's been working on this from top to bottom. Did I miss anything? Um, Security property updates, Lisa, you probably got more property updates. Um, I'm just to piggyback off of you for just an example. When I started here back in December, five months ago, I was probably seeing two to three calls a night for the suites. Now I probably see maybe five calls for a week and that's involving core and every agency involved. So we've seen a, when he says drastic, it's a big, probably about 20 call drop a week. Um, we're also working on cameras for the neighborhood. Then we're going to probably try to get some security cameras over at Spring Creek and the Lodge to just help with, not the Lodge, sorry, Spring Creek and Fall River. Um, property updates. I've been working with Efficiency Works here at the city and New Edison to get more, better lighting throughout these properties. So we've been, we've gotten some grants. So we will start installing new lighting for the exterior of the suites. We hope to that install to start in two weeks. Briarwood, we hope to start in about a week and a half. Then Aspen Meadows neighborhood. Then we are currently having the grant evaluations go through for the lodge and Spring Creek so that they will all have LED lighting on the exterior of the building and some hallways just keeping our, our costs down as well with switching this up and better lighting on the exteriors. And then um, finally, for me, before we move to resident culture and Karen, um, I did want you to know we have moved the staff to the Civic Center. Um, and so they're here. We did exercise the lease with VCP. So they're in the, in the property, which for us is very important. I, I talked to you all about this before. Their experience in managing housing um, really is a good fit in the partnership and the communication where we're still managing the units but they have a conduit to them and, and they're used to that world was a good transition. And so it, it has operationally for me, um, allowed me to have more interaction with folks just because they're in the building. But I think it's also really truly bringing them into the fold in the city organization, which is always, it's difficult when we're in multiple locations. And so we did complete that work. You sound like a robot, Tom. Oh, oh. That was not a comment about accountants in general. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me now? Is that better? Better. You can put it in the chat if you want. Where's the chat? Yeah, I don't see the chat function. Hmm. So, so to move things forward, um, I think I'll just talk if that's all right, Cameron. Um, and just just uh, 
a couple updates on the, the resident culture. So, um, and, and just to, uh, to build on what Harold indicated about the um, staff moving into the civic center. So, so just to clarify that um, we had basically seven staff members. So um, four staff members, that would be the two housing choice vouchers staff, Lisa, you see her in her new space and then Olivia. So they are over in the community services uh, side of things. And then across the hall at the civic center, we have uh, Kendra and then the names of our new staff members in accounting is um, our uh, April Beamer, who's our accounting technician, our accounting tech, and then Heather Clark is our accountant. And so Kendra, Heather and April, um, are their offices are in with, uh, in with accounting and, and finance on, on the other side of the, of the civic center. So the, um, so I did want to let you know that we are in, uh, we are starting the process. We have talked a while about, uh, starting to address the, to, to work on, uh, resident culture, um, within our, within our, uh, residences that, that we manage. We are in a position where we're, we're, we can start that, that process. So, so just to let you know, the community managers have identified, I think, uh, approximately 60 residents in mm -hmm. um, all of the, the properties that the LHA manages. And what we are going to initially do is we have developed an interview guide that um, that there will be several of us that are um, that will be interviewing individual residents, and we are going to be ask them really about four dimensions of um, of, of community living, if you will. Um, so those have to do with a sense of community, um, how to have trusting um, relationships, trusting and respectful. Uh, relationships within the uh, in the residents with each other and also and with city and with um, excuse me with LHA staff members. Uh, the third area is in communication, and the fourth area that we'll be interviewing about is uh, property management logistics. So so basically, it's a it's in an appreciative format where we're really looking at looking forward, we're asking residents to reflect on the best of what they've seen in those areas and how we can build on that as, um, as LHA in our residential communities. We will basically then take that data from the individual interviews and then we will reach out and engage the broader communities um, around the, um, what, what that means what we learned and and how to start moving those forward into um, priorities for um, for sustainable improvement within our within our properties. So I did want to um, so we hope to start that process that interview process. Uh, I would imagine we can start that in June, have those completed in July, and then continue on with the with the resident. Um, reaching out to all of the, the residents. I did wanna let you know, and this is something for you all to think about as advisory board members, that we've identified there's, um, there's at least four areas that the advisory board members can get involved in if you uh, so choose to do so. One, we could use a couple of um, test uh, interviews. So we could use a, a couple individuals from the board to, um, for us to interview and we can test the interview guide and see what, what we need to do to make that a stronger guide. There might be some questions like, oh, that doesn't work. So, uh, so anyhow, we could use some test interviewers if anyone feels like they want to um, be a guinea pig in that arena. We also can use advisory board members to help with the interviews, individual interviews of the residents. We could use advisory board members to help us to analyze the data once we um, get all of the interviews back. We have to, we have to uh, con basically compile and uh, figure out what all this data means. And then there's a, the last part of this is what we call making meaning and prioritizing um, the data. So those are the four areas that we are um, that we would really love to have 
advisory board members be involved in. I know in the past that you've identified that we, we would like that you would like to be involved in some way, shape or form with some of the work that we're doing with the, um, the individuals who live in our communities. And so we are, we are ready to roll that out. So what I will do is I will send a follow-up uh, communication email to you all. And, um, and with, those, with those opportunities for um, in, engagement for you to think about and, um, and let me know what you are interested in. So that, so Michelle Waite with, um, with Senior Services is, is helping to coordinate that um, along with Lisa. Me, um, Olivia is is involved in that too, and um, and so we'll we'll reach out to you and to see if anyone has any interest in participating in the um, in kind of this next next phase of work that we're doing regarding the um, the the culture of our residential properties um, in in the LHA. Soon to follow, we'll probably be doing a similar process with our our organizational culture. Um, so we'll, we'll see how this process works with our residents and, uh, and, and soon we will be doing this with our, um, within our organizational culture. We do have some vacancies that we hope to be able to fill um, before we get this started. So we do have, we, we would like to be able to, um, to fill a couple of uh, community manager uh, positions. Um, we've, we've had those on in that recruitment process for a, a, a little while. Um, and we're, we're just, we're not, we're having a hard time getting um, qualified applicants. So we are continuing to try to figure that out. Um, and, and then we also, I think as we might have mentioned is that we will be hiring um, a new supportive services uh, coordinator for the suites. Um, what Brandy Queen has been doing is, is kind of filling in temporarily and, and really providing um, some case management, but basically clinical consultation for, um, for some of the residents there. And then we are moving forward. This is something that we included in the budget to, um, to hire a supportive services coordinator for, the, um, for basically Hearthstone and, and Lodge, our 202 properties. So we're... Um, we're we're trying to figure out the right mix for the um, for those positions, um, what we need in terms of skill, what the market will pay, and what we can afford. So we're trying to figure all that out. But um, but I think as soon as we're able to bring all of those folks on board, then we will really start that um, that organizational culture work within the um, the the LHA. So that is my update, and we'd be glad to answer any questions. And it is fabulous to have our seven Lama Housing Authority staff members here in the Civic Center. It is, as Harold mentioned, you know, I can just go down the hall or I can yell over, hey, Olivia. <laughs> so, so to have that kind of informal interaction to help us build the team and get work done is, um, is priceless. So we are, we are very happy to, to be together. Thanks, Karen. Uh, anything else on the city report? No, so let's roll on to item six, other business. Any other business for the good of the order? Tom. Well, I had questions kind of on, you can hear me now, my robotic? Yes, well, uh, we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> um, updates from last meeting. Uh, so. The new pennant system with Hearthstone and Lodge that was supposed to be fully implemented April 21st. We're good to go on that one. Awesome. We we are. Just to update, the pull cords are coming out today. Oh, so <laughs> We had a few issues getting it up and going. They gave us the wrong number. Uh, but what, like, And again, that's the relationship. So then Sarah communicated and we got it worked out. So it's going. All right, good. Um, and then the other thing was, I think... Uh, Kathy, you mentioned that there might be additional vouchers provided to LHA after a meeting on May 10th with the consortium. That's some bad news, sad news. Yeah, we did not get um, meet the minimum threshold to get those. You had to 
through their formula, you had to qualify to get at least 25 um, vouchers. And we didn't meet that criteria. Um, as a matter of fact, we were kind of surprised Boulder County Housing Authority and um, Boulder Housing Partners, which you saw the number of vouchers they have compared to ours, they only qualified for 35 each. Um, so it was, uh, I think, so we got 70-ish in Boulder County. Um, there was 70,000 nationwide. So um, we did not get selected um, for that, unfortunately. We will be working with it. Stronger to get additional vouchers for the authority can look at? Yeah, so we're we're working toward to improve the number of vouchers or increase the number of vouchers. Um, we now have um, really good data that we put into HUD's two-year tool, which projects forward what your budget's going to be and how many vouchers you can you can lease with your budget. We just um, opened up ten more vouchers um, and have got seven of them filled um, within two months, less than two months. Um, so that process, we will take that data, we'll put it into the tool and we'll keep adjusting it um, and projecting forward what we can lease, um, uh, lease up new vouchers. So we're continuing to work on that. Okay. And then before I went robotic, uh, the signage in front of, I guess, the Briarwood, are we going to get rid of that then that says the Longmont Housing Authority since really we're no longer there? Yeah, we're um, they're working with planning in terms of what they need to do from this from a sign code perspective, and so you don't want to take it off and not replace it because that creates sign code issues. Okay. And so they're they're working through and working with uh, our planning division on that issue. Okay. And, and the only the, thing I would add are we going to change the official address then to the city as well? Yes, and we have done that. So we have. Okay. Um, and I'm sure we're continuing to do that, but uh, yes, we, we've been making that address change um, for to 350 Kimbark Street for the kind of the official um, location for the, the housing authority. And, you know, and then I think to Harold's point is that we also at, we also put in the lease agreement that uh, VCP would, uh, would consult with the um, housing authority in addition to planning particularly around the, um, the sandstone sign out on Main Street is that, um, that so we wanna make sure that, that is, that's able to remain or maybe they can put a skin over that. But anyhow, we, we wanna be consulted for the final, um, final sign design for sure. what goes on that Main Street sign right. for sure. And I think just the a clarification on those, those vouchers that Kathy talked about, Again, those are emergency housing vouchers. Those are primarily focused on individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Those are not permanent vouchers. So, um, so, so they, um, they, we can lease up through uh, September of 2023. Um, and, and if any of, uh, any of those uh, uh, residents who have a, a voucher um, and if they let those go after September 2023, those vouchers will not be replaced. And, um, and then I think as Kathy indicated that we are working together, uh, we have the homeless solution for Boulder County. We, all of the entities are working together. So we also anticipate that um, Longmont individuals who are experiencing homelessness or, or maybe we are also looking at, at using those vouchers in more of a move on um, scenario where maybe we have individuals who have been in permanent supportive housing and maybe they have more stability that they are ready to move on for, um, for a, a, a tenant-based voucher, that those might be individuals that would be um, first eligible or we'll use some of those new vouchers for that. So Lamont residents will be in the mix and certainly um, some of our suites residents that are in permanent supportive housing would um, would possibly be able to access those vouchers. Thanks for the clarification. Any other business? Arlene. Well, I just have kind of an idea and I'm not even sure where it needs to go or if it's even a viable idea. But when we're looking at affordable housing, and particularly when we're looking at, um, you know, three, four levels of housing with 
60, 80, say 120 units in there. And we're looking at the possibility that the people moving in there are going to be two income families. What is the, how can we add a daycare center into that um, to help those people? Um, I realize that we might be taking away from a rental unit, the space, but I think that the leasing of that particular area for a daycare, childcare, even after school care would offset whatever it was that we would get in rent. So I don't know where that needs to go, if that's even you know a possibility, but I was wondering if that's something we could take a look at to help these people out. You know, Rather than have to drive across town with their kids, it would be right there. And of course it would be licensed. Interesting idea that, that should definitely go. Yeah, we're all discussion. thinking right now. Yeah. Well, and the only thing that I would say is that, and I don't know, Laura might have some information, but um, Boulder Housing Partners, um, they have incorporated that model in several of their properties. So it's kind of a, they, they have built like a community center um, as part of some of their residential developments and have, have provided, um, you know, those services. So they have, um, they have um, the I Have a Dream Foundation that provides, um, you know, support to, um, you know, after school and and um, and Scholastica support. Uh, so they op they operate a, a program in, in in one of the Boulder Housing Partners community centers. So so we certainly can reach out and and uh, talk to Boulder Housing Partners um, ab about how they have done that. They certainly have incorporated that in some of their properties. Holly? I know that uh, they do that in various um, housing authority projects in Los Angeles, too, and all over the place. Uh, I mean, all over the country. It's a really good idea because child care is one of the most essential things for women who 20% of women have left the workforce. And that's the main reason why. And, Speaking for myself as having been a single parent, uh, <laughs> it's a real nightmare uh, to try to find childcare, good childcare. And um, if it's in the building, it is really, really helpful. Uh, and it is also a great cost savings to everybody. So I, I think it's a really a good idea that we should pursue if we're able to find um, ways to do the funding and we you know it is one of city council's um goals to work with uh, early childhood education but this is certainly um really important to people with low income is to have some help with child care yeah it, i know bhp does that i i can't remember if we have that set up at kestrel i know we have a community center but i i don't think at kestrel we have child care but if we have if we're building any developments with the idea of putting in either um, some market rate rental commercial property and then a community center that we can rent out. I mean, if we provided a space for a childcare provider at a reduced cost and then worked with either Head Start and then also CCAP through the state, um, we might be able to provide residents um, with some pretty, pretty affordable childcare. Um, I think that's also a great idea because as I'm patting the butt of my baby now in this meeting, <laughs> finding childcare is hard um, and expensive. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like that idea if it's possible. Well, I think this is the, the exact right time to bring it up as we're, we're starting to develop our, our goals for the future and having a more in-depth discussion with council. So good timing. Any other business? Well, seeing none, I would move that we adjourn and focus our attention on getting ready for the next meeting. And if there are no objections, I'm not even going to vote. We're just going to say we're adjourned and uh, appreciate your time this morning.